Okay, it is September 4th, and we are live on the Digital Roundtable. We have another great guest. Things are happening. Apparently, John Butler is waiting for the governor of Texas to say hi to him. <laughs> he is in some place downtown Austin. I am spending all my time planning the Digital Roundtable 360 Summit 2024, which is at the great, wonderful Drisco Hotel. September 24th through the 26th. And these three gentlemen, Llewellyn King, John Sibley Butler, and Robert Mays will be speaking, keynoting, and sharing their wisdom. But today, we have a shortcut of that because the water thing is such a huge challenge. And I have no idea how Robert Mays and Texas are going to fix this challenge because the <laughs> grid needs to double in size the manufacturing sector is doubling in size. 2,000 people move to Texas every day, and they're not bringing water, wastewater, grid, or roads with them. I have Johnny, you tell me. What are you going to tell the governor? Are you going to ask for more water for rubber maize? What are you doing? Well, what I think is we need more control systems. I think when you look at the electric, the electric, the electric grid, it's not just the fact that everybody's moving to Texas, but the point is we can't control this thing. So as I said, we got the same kind of, uh, uh, we have to, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, have, we got the same kind of issue that we have with an old car and all of a sudden you got a jet and you can try to control it with the same kind of knobs. So what we need to do is get the efficiency done on how we control the grid. And I'm going to talk to uh, the Aaron Demerson, the governors who run the enterprise with uh, concept in Texas, about what we need to do with the grid, technology transfer, and those kind of things. But, let me but tell you what about, about water? What about water? Well, I think we just need to sacrifice Galveston again with another hurricane, and we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, look, I've always said this. Ben Barnes and I, Lieutenant Governor Ben Barnes, years ago, we wanted to bring water on the pipe from states like Louisiana, just like we do other kind of resources. But going through every county, you need to pick up, you know, every county used to say it's okay. There'll be no problem in getting the water where it needs to be if we can put all in, if we can put all and gas also under the ground. We certainly could put water pipes under the ground and have a control system to put it where it needs to be when it needs to go. So we can have water coming from New, from from the Northeast. We can have water coming from Louisiana, from Alabama, where, you know, there are no water problems. Because where I'm from, if you, if you put your heel in the ground, then, a, a, you know, a water, water, water will come up. So it's how we think about the water issue. And we need to treat water just like we treat petroleum, put pipes under the ground, and run the water through the different pipes to the different states. Hmm. What do you think about that, young man? Good thinking, good thinking. Llewellyn, what do you think? First of all, there are several issues here. You cannot uh, just have people endlessly move to one place. The point, either the market, because it gets too expensive, because the facilities there have gone up in cost. They're not high now in Texas, but they will go up. Water will become very expensive. It depends what you use the water for. For example, if you're going to pipe water in from other states, the large expense, but in laying the pipes and keeping it running, and that means you probably can't use the water uh, for domestic lawns and ornamental gardens, etc. It will have a higher end use value. And that involves very large societal changes. But it's not the first time the water has caused societal changes. The second thing is the move into Texas, a huge number of people. We've seen this before. Last time it was into California. These things go in waves and circumstance change, largely economic circumstance, and the wave ends. Now we have a different possible change agent, and that is heat. If we're going to continue to see abnormally hot and therefore become normal, excessive heat in Texas in summer, people are going to be disinclined to move there. And the dependence on electricity goes up 
uh, tremendously because everything has to be air conditioned and the human suffering plus the everything else that goes wrong if you lose the electricity. So a lot of adjustments have to be made. You know, we're just watching in parts of Europe where suddenly they cannot accommodate one more tourist. No matter how many fistfuls of dollars they have, they can't get any more people into certain places. And they've had to do something to curb the flow. So these are realities. These are resource realities, and they're going to come into play. On the other hand, systems, and uh, Johnny, I think, uh, uh, probably overestimates uh, the, the state of the grid, but I have just been doing some extraordinarily exciting reporting on agents in AI and how they will be able to manage systems very efficiently and how friendly they will be to users. We're about to see, according to a company in New York called Emergence, and its CEO, Satya Nitta, who I've interviewed on television and uh, talked to several times, and I've written an article about it, which you will get in the normal way on <clears throat> Saturday. Um, this is a new departure. It's the new face, or will be the new face of, the, of AI, which is hugely... Uh, user-friendly. You'll be able to talk to these agents as though we were talking to each other. If sure. you're planning travel, you'll be like talking to your travel agent. If you're planning a grid change, you'll be like talking to Pablo Vegas. So a whole new world of technology is at hand. And the great thing about living in a technological age is that we have it to fall back on to fix and repair things that are in need of fixing and repairing and to bring about uh, new dimensions in society. It's enormously sure. exciting. So uh, you will see resource constrictions in various parts of the world. I'll tell you something else, which I think I mentioned previously, but which is worth looking at. It's too early to say if it's a trend, but the mid-Atlantic, the tropical Atlantic, is suddenly cooling quite fast. Hmm. which means that we're going to have probably fewer hurricanes and less abnormal weather next year. It's too early to make that as a solid prediction, but it's the kind of thing that you need to look out for because not everything goes up in a graph line like this forever and ever and ever. Things change, sure, including population movement, demand for electricity, demand on water, and... Uh, but water, I think, for Texas is a huge challenge. And I mentioned this quite a few times, and I think when Linda was on the program, she mentioned it. Um, there simply isn't that much water in Texas, and you're going to have to conserve it and change lifestyles to accommodate a fundamental shortage of water. Sure. Well, we have we have the right person to answer all this, but before <laughs> I let him answer anything or say hello, my dear friend, Dr. Robert Mays, professor of practice in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, and he's actually the executive director of the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment at Texas State University, where I have the pleasure of participating in many other activities as well. Uh, the Meadows Center actually fulfills its mission by integrating activities across four pillars of action, research, leadership, education, and stewardship, and Robert has been there for a long time, and he has seen the fruits of his labor. And actually, these challenges are gigantic. But Robert, what say you? Um, well, thank you all for for having me on the show. Um, you know, and, and responding to like your initial question to yeah. the co-hosts and their responses. I, you know, there's certain it's certainly true that there we have border states, New Mexico excluded. That, that have excess water, but boy, you want to get people riled up, you tell them you're going to move that water out of the state. And, right. you know, my, my sense is that unless there's a national emergency, the, the odds of bringing water, even from Louisiana, because there was an attempt to tap into Toledo Bend, which my understanding is Louisiana barely uses that, uh, you know, people people just went crazy over that and it, it died immediately. 
Mississippi River, folks have long dreamed about tapping into the Mississippi River. Um, it's kind of crazy. Like in Texas, uh, you need a permit to pull water out of the river. And Mississippi is Eastern surface water doctrine. You just you just flop your pipe into that baby and suck. Um, but I'm convinced that the policy in a target state would change immediately for that. Not to mention that we're seeing the Mississippi River struggle more and more these days, right. probably as a consequence of, of climate change. Um, there's, there's a fellow named um, Seamus McGraw. He wrote a, a book about water in Texas called A Thirsty Land. And, uh, and he, he asked me a similar question when he was writing that book. And my response to that was that the Gulf of Mexico is what allows me to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's seawater desalination. Mm -hmm. um, yep, it's expensive. But I like to tell folks um, or ask folks, you know, it's more expensive than desalinated seawater no water. And <laughs> right. so it's, it's, it's going to come, um, you know, Corpus Christi has several projects that are in the permitting, um, phase. There's, there's been some drama associated with that based on the, the brine concentrate disposal. Cause when you desalinate water, you get a saltier side stream that you got to get rid of. Um, those folks are looking to, um, dispose of that water in the, in the Bay and estuary. And so, you know, there's a lot of environmental concerns, about that. Um, but the state does allow a general permit for offshore mm -hmm. um, disposal, which means there's no public process. It's just an administrative checklist as long as your um, pipe to discharge is far enough offshore and there's enough mixing. So um, so that that's what I'm, I'm looking for. And, and I can't imagine a future, like even for Central Texas, um, Austin, San Marcos, San Antonio, that doesn't include seawater desalination. The other, the other part of this um, that Llewellyn um, alluded to is the climate. You know, we, we are seeing uh, new droughts of record pop up. We're seeing record low flows, particularly in central Texas to our reservoirs. Um, you know, we're seeing things we haven't seen before. And I think that's a consequence of the, of the warming temperatures. And that's going to become more and more of a challenge. And so our, our rainfall dependent water resources are going to become much more fickle, um, certainly much more fickle than what we've seen in the past record. And when you're striving for resilience in water supplies, which is going to be absolutely key for our economy, um, agriculture, you know, everything, mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to try to try to climate proof our resources as much as possible. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to predict. I mean, it's difficult to predict the weather next week. Mm -hmm. um, imagine trying to predict it 50 years from now um, and, and, and all kinds of human interventions as well as all these potential feedbacks. And so one thing I note the folks, it's like, it's like, we don't know what the uncertainty in the future really is. We know it's pretty uncertain. Mm -hmm. It could be, it could be really bad. Um, but, but we do know that seawater, <laughs> seawater is a hundred percent reliable, or at least the Gulf of Mexico is not going away. Now there's other things, like if the grid goes down, you don't have power to desalt, well, that's another issue. So a yeah. number of these things enter. So I have a couple of questions real quick, Robert. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on how in the world then California convinced Colorado to give their water? How can California convince Colorado to give their water? What do you mean? Yeah. Well, does, doesn't LA get water from the Colorado River and the oh. Sierras? No? Yeah, the, the, I mean. I mean, how did that happen? Um, I'm Money? not an ex I'm not an expert on it. Well, I mean, California does border in part on the Colorado River, and so mm -hmm. so the states got together and divided the water along mm -hmm. the river. New Mexico gets some water from the Colorado mm -hmm. River, which they pipe over the mountains, dump in the Rio Grande, flow to Albuquerque, pull out of Albuquerque, run to the top of an arroyo, infiltrate into an arroyo, and then pull out of a well field. Wow. Um, so now, let, me, let, let, me, let me say one thing about the model. I mean, it's like asking who's my son say, well, you know, this generation is not buying houses. Well, the next generation is going to be immigrants. They're going to buy the houses. So my question is, you got a closed model of what happens to water. We're going to have a lot of rainwater. All of a sudden, when we have a flood in Austin, oh, we had a drought for two months and we've got a flood now. So like you said, there's no way to predict that. But when you, when you get Newtonian, you know, when you get away from that Newtonian closed system of understanding it, then it might be that there might be too much water in the future. Ah, I, I, you yeah. know, 
So it's not that, so what your model is based on a closed system, a Newtonian model of the space, which is closed. But when you open up and say, you know, things will be coming in or water will be coming in, we cannot predict the amount of water that we'll have. I remember 1980, 81, we had to, we were in a big drought and then we had the flood of 81. And we had too much water. So how do you, how do you really model this stuff? And by the way, I've got to go see the governor. I'm being called. So <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay, y'all take care. I'm out. I'm out. Okay. Take care. Bye -bye. Hey, that, that's that's a great question. I mean, um, and it's one of one of the things that we're we're working here on at the Meadow Center is like researching how do you build climate model information in the water planning, and and um, and there's something something called the you know, planning under deep uncertainty, mm -hmm. and and and. Deep uncertainty is just a, a fancy academic term for we don't know what, what the hell's going to happen, and mm -hmm. so, and so, yeah. you know, and so what you wind up doing is is really you wind up you know building as much resilience in as possible. Now on the rainfall thing, the climate projections for Texas are um, it could be rainier, it could be drier. Basically, there's so much uncertainty in the models that we don't we don't know. For the vast majority of the state, um, but um, what the models do show is greater intensity of rainfall. So the rain that we do get is going to show up in these bursts, um, and we're probably going to see longer dry spells in between. And then don't don't get trapped in thinking that oh it's all about rainfall. The increased temperatures are a killer because mm. where where does runoff into our rivers and recharge our aquifers start? It's at the it's at the soil, and where the rain hits the soil. And so if the soils are dry and getting drier and dry out because of higher temperatures, and plants are using more water from the soil, then we're not getting as much runoff to our rivers. We're not getting as much recharge, even if the rainfall stays the same. Mm -hmm. um, so. So it's so it's a real challenge. I, um, you know, the temperatures are much more predictable in terms of you know it's going to get warmer in Texas, and then how warm is going to depend on one emissions, you know, what the actual emissions are, and then two, which is the big big unknown, is what are the potential feedback triggers that pop up. What 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 about what about this thing that happened in Dubai a few months ago where they were injecting something in the sky? And they created too much rain. What's going on with that? Um, so, so I guess I hadn't. I, I'd heard about the flood. Um, mm -hmm. I hadn't heard. That, hadn't heard that there was a. Uh, um, I guess cloud seeding component to that. They, they, yeah. They, they, yeah, they're they're doing it. They're doing it in all of the Saudi Middle East for for years now, and and apparently Ch Chinese are big into it. Right. So, what um, are your thoughts of that? And then, and then there are some folks in Texas doing it. Some of the groundwater districts are okay. doing it as a groundwater conservation measure. Um, so my thoughts on that is like the physics are all there. Mm -hmm. um, you you can create rain out of clouds with um, with cloud seeding. Yeah, the physics are all there. Um, what what's a little unknown to me um, is, and maybe less clear, is how much of a difference is that really making mm -hmm. um and uh, at least in texas because i have been involved in kind of reviewing efforts in texas in my past life at the state mm -hmm. um you know the way the way those studies have been done have not been done in a way to answer that question um, um you know almost kind of needs to be some blind blind thing like like you know somebody independently identifies target clouds and then you send the pilot out and then you flip a coin as to whether the seeded or not, and then look at those two d data sets statistically. Nobody wants to do that because there's costs involved and yada, mm -hmm. yada, yada. But um, there is a suggestion, there is, there is statistical evidence for a decrease in hail damage mm -hmm. from cloud seeding. Um, and there's some recent studies that are you know, like out of Colorado that are showing that, uh, uh, suggesting that there is um, a, an improvement in rainfall. So. I'm still I'm still waiting for the data to come in, looking at the data that's coming in, but it is sure. intriguing. Don't now, do last, it. Don't last, do it. Don't do what Saudi Arabia did though. Last quick question <laughs> before Llewellyn jumps in. How come um the code for cities uh couldn't be enforced so that there is more rainwater catching and gray water piping use? Um great, great question. 
there's 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 no reason cities can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, San Antonio for a very long time has required larger buildings like think big box retail to mm -hmm. um, collect air conditioning condensate and use that for um, non-potable indoor uses like flushing toilets and urinals. Austin um, cool. earlier this year um, passed regs that require all buildings um, of a certain size. I forget what the, I forget what the low end of that is um, to capture rainwater and condensate harvesting, okay. and and then use that for indoor non-potable use, including washing clothes. Mm -hmm. um, and so so that's um, so that's a pretty amazing development. I think I think communities are getting there as mm -hmm. we're struggling with. Mm -hmm this growth and, and the fact that easy water is gone. So I think, you know, I think we're going to get there. We're going to see more and more folks doing it. Um, the, um, um, gray water, I'm not a fan of gray water harvesting. Um, no, no. Dude, <laughs> why not? Um, so, so if you're on a centralized sewer system, uh, my advice is don't do it. Don't put programs to do it. And the reason is just because the water goes down the drain does not mean it's wasted. Um, that water goes to a wastewater treatment plant and it, it gets treated. Traditionally, it then, then gets discharged to the river. And there's certainly benefits to the river, um, both for downstream users and the environment. More and more communities are reusing part of that water. So what goes down the drain gets reused. And then more locally, if you're capturing gray water, and I'm talking like water out of washing machines, sinks and showers, um, because it has soaps in it, and it has increased salinity. Um, and then, depending on how crazy of a night you had on Sixth Street, um, and uh, maybe you lost, con I'll get, I'll get uh, explicit. Maybe you lost control of your bowels or something, you know. And so, <laughs> there's skid marks. You got to clean in the in the washing machine. Well, now you got pathogens in that water. Mm. And so, when you're using it outside, you got to be real careful because of the the salt buildup in the soil, as well as uh, potential exposure to pathogens. So to me, I'm like, if you're a central sewer, it's it's not being wasted. What is being wasted is the consumption, which happens from what, what Llewellyn was talking about, outdoor irrigation. You know, there you're putting water out and it's uh, evaporating or plant sweating back up into the atmosphere and getting consumed. Right, right. Llewellyn? Well, I have a few comments. First of all, is I think um, Robert is a little bit optimistic about how you're going to reintroduce the salt into the ocean from desalination. Uh, it tends to be very concentrated, not to be absorbed back into the water with any ease at all. It forms a plume and then it sits along the bottom, killing everything it touches. It's very lethal, salt is poison in concentration. And nobody has solved the problem. Saying that you don't need I, di I disagree, but I'll let you finish. Uh, uh, saying you don't need a permit to do it doesn't solve the problem. Um, uh, so that's one thing. And if you get a lot of desalination, you're going to see a lot of uh, potential contamination of inshore water. And, and basically a large effect on the aquatic life in that region. Uh, the other... The yeah, thing that comes to mind is I've heard all of this before. Uh, I grew up in a dry part of the world, um, what's now Zimbabwe, and we had plans to build uh, pipelines to bring water from the Zambezi Valley and from the Zambezi River because the Zambezi River never ran dry, except it's pretty dry now, so much so that the Kariba Dam on the Zambezi between <coughs> Zimbabwe and uh, its neighbor uh, cannot generate any electricity. There's not enough water. And then the largest, what is normally the largest man-made water impoundment on Earth. Um, so these, we talked a lot about cloud seeding, except you need clouds. If you don't have any clouds, you may have the best cloud seeding technology on Earth, but you've got the same problem. No water. No water up there, no water down here. And uh, so... You've got to really look at where you go from here. Using less is your first resource. And, and it's I, a large one. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very difficult to implement. We're all 
we all live, I because I've lived in dry parts of the world, I have this instinct not to flush the toilet from minor usage. Uh, this doesn't amuse people. It, uh, 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 the, this is something that is inbred into in places where water is short. Uh, we, if we can't see it, we think it's not there or there's plenty of it, like aquifers. I mean, dry them, we suck all the water out. Uh, I'd be interested to know what you do about this plume that goes in from desalination and lies along the ocean floor. At least everything I've read and been able to, I've been quite interested in it for quite a long time. I was interested in the use of um, high temperature nuclear. Uh, high temperature gas reactors, for example, to very efficient desalination, except, oops, what do we do with the salt? Uh, somewhat the problem eventually we'll face with carbon capture and storage. What do we do with the carbon and put it in the ground? And that has consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, waste has consequences, no matter what you do with it. But uh, tell me what you what sure. your research tells. So, you so the, on on seawater desal concerns are are all legitimate, um, and you know those concerns have been expressed in discharging to you know Corpus Christi Bay, um, which you know is shallow, um, you know not not a lot of current in there. Concern about the salt water going on the bottom, um, affecting the wildlife. But but there's also quite a bit of research engineering um, as well as systems um, in place that do offshore um, both intakes as well as outfalls for the brine concentrate. And you know as long as you've got a current, it doesn't go and sink to the bottom. It's getting mixed. Typically, the brine concentrate on a seawater desal system is twice, it's twice as salty as the seawater. So you got 100 gallons coming in, you got 50 gallons of darn pure water, and then you got 50 gallons, it's twice as saline. Um, and, and so, the, you know, there are, there are placements, designs um, in such a way to have minimal to no impact. You know, Australia has been a leader on this because um, they do, they are pretty concerned about environmental impacts of their seawater desal and have showed not only do their intakes not affect um, um, sea life, but their outfall also just mixes um, very quickly. So, so I, I believe, you know, I have faith in our engineering friends that they can figure that stuff out. Now, you know, the folks in Corpus Christi, they're trying to save money because it costs money to build a pipeline offshore. And so they're trying to do the discharge intakes and discharge close to where the plants are. And I'm not a hydrodynamics modeling person, so I'm not going to weigh in and whether what they're doing is safe for the environment or not. But but I do know that you know there are folks that are concerned um, about discharging that closed system. I also agree with you 100% on conservation. Um, you know, I've, I've, my wife and I have um, 5,000 gallon rainwater harvesting tank at our house in Austin. Um, you know, our daily um, water use is about 35 gallons per person per day, which is um, considered really low for a household. We don't use any city water outside. Um, and, and we're able to, you know, and, and, you know, my wife is not a big fan of if it's yellow, let it mellow. So, you know, so we, we do flush, but we have to do a flush toilet, which saves a little bit of water. Um, but if everybody in the state lived the way that we lived, um, it would not solve the water problem in Texas. It's, there's like too many people, there's too, too much need um, for conservation conservation to get us out of this should it be done yes i agree in fact if i was king of the world i'd be i'd get rid of lawns um, right across right. the state um, sure. and go go to zero escaping um, but it's not gonna it's not gonna solve everything um and I've, I've made those calculations i forget the exact numbers but it's it's like yeah you know if everybody lived the way i did that we, we would still be short of water for, at least for our municipal users mm -hmm. not so to mention not to mention you know big box manufacturers and stuff like that. So what about, what about, there seems to be a big push for, and this doesn't work everywhere, but your thoughts on atmospheric water generation. 
Um, so, so, uh, for a long time, I've been kind of thinking that's just crazy talk. I mean, I get it. Physics are there. There's machines. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, we, many of us here in Texas, we already have an atmospheric water generation generator at home. It's your mm -hmm. AC, your HVAC mm -hmm. system, that little right, pipe right. that's dripping out and the bushes look really great by it. That's an atmospheric water generating system. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm getting more intrigued by it as a, um, as a potential source of water. It's, you know, and part of it is, 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 uh, um, you know, if you believe what's, if you believe the projections on solar implementation mm -hmm. going forward, you know, we're, we're potentially facing an energy revolution where power mm -hmm. becomes essentially free. I mean, it won't be yeah. free, but it'll become yeah, yeah. Yeah. dirt cheap, in which case then power for desal goes away, but mm -hmm. also power for atmospheric water generation goes away. And that's the biggest, I think the biggest cost on that. And so, mm -hmm. so I don't know, I'm intrigued. I I've, I've added that as a talking point to my standard slide mm -hmm. talks about different technologies. Um, there's uh, you know, and people are starting to employ it. The U S military has used it. Mm -hmm. They use it out, they use it out in the, the middle East. So, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be Houston to generate the water. And then uh, the um, <clears throat> um, F1, um, mm -hmm street racing european kind of street racing they had the race in las vegas recently yep formula and they, one yeah. and they yep. have a big um, um kind of net zero goal with that program and mm -hmm. recognizing that water in las vegas um, is an issue they used atmospheric water generators to generate water in las vegas to wash the roads down and things like sure. that so sure. um so yeah i think it's uh i think there's potential there yeah, there's a there's a just as an FYI, there's a company called Sky H2O, Terrell Jones, who's the VP there. They want to join Cedar, and um, and they're gonna I'm gonna be introducing them to you, and I've invited them to join the panel after your keynote. Okay, so we'll we'll see if they say yes. But um, you know, I've always been intrigued by it, and you know, I think it's all. I'm not an expert on all the, um sort of uh, so systems around how do you optimize that to be minimal, um, you know, uh, generation to, I can drink, you know, but I've seen solutions for, uh, you know, bottles where you can, you know, collect enough water to drink while you're hiking somewhere. It seems, it seems like it's, it, it, it's, it's really, um, it makes a lot of sense. So it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, but, one of uh, the I'm mean, interested in this too, apart from the fact it's expensive and there's a large energy quotient, um, you end up with a distilled water that has to then be used. You then have to mineralize it to make it a drinking water. Sure. Uh, or to have almost any use except washing your car with it. And it's too expensive to wash a car with it. So <laughs> there are limits to uh, to it. Uh, and sure. again, you need the resource. You need humidity. Without humidity, it doesn't work. Yeah. We don't do very well in Zambia where there's no humidity. Uh, we're trying to get it out of the air, although... Uh, Surely somebody will try and sell. I noticed that in the uh, yeah. Q&A function, uh, viewer says there are dead spots or Catalina as a result of desalination. I don't know anything about it. I just mention it. I, I think I think desalination, I always thought it was a superb idea until you get to deal with the salt or brine, as they like to call it, which seems a little less offensive than salt. But it is a big problem, as is anything where you have a very large affluent stream, and that's what it is. It's an affluent stream. Yeah, and I don't, and I don't know about Catalina. And also, I'm not saying that all seawater desal is safe, but but like if you are concerned about the environment, which in my opinion you should be, you know, it 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 can be done in a way that minimizes or eliminates those concerns. The problem is, is for everything, money. It costs more to do that. Sure. So if there isn't a you know, regulatory requirement to do that, then folks folks aren't gonna aren't gonna do it. Um, or if the society decides the environment's not important enough, then. But I, but I but I think ultimately your point of what's more exemp expensive uh, deal with diesel water and how to fix that, whatever risks are involved versus not having any, it's a no brainer, right? Mm -hmm. So 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 Robert. Um, you know, I am sure you have your pulse on this, but 
Texas is growing uh, at a pace that we have never seen before. And I know that BCEQ and the governor's office and the state congress and a lot of things are being done and planned. And what are we doing that is different or unique? Or how are we going to fulfill all the infrastructure requirements, especially on water, for this gigantic growth ahead of us? Um, well, one one thing, and it's it's not so unique now um, as it was maybe 10, 20 years ago, because a lot of folks have seen what Texas has done and have, and have implemented their own, but water mm -hmm. planning. So, mm -hmm. you know, Texas has instituted a regional water planning process where the state's divided into 16 regions. There are stakeholders that represent all the different water use categories. And then with the, the guiding hand of the Water Development Board to ensure everybody's honest about the data, you know, those folks choose where their future water is going to come from. Mm -hmm. And that's that's been that's been great just simply from a planning process. You get the locals involved. They're the ones that are going to have to implement and pay. Um, so, and then you also create advocates for water security for the state. So in my opinion, that's been a, an amazing, a fabulous success. It's also creates opportunity for a lot of creativity. Um, now, you know, I've got friends that are like, you know, those folks are an old school, um, you know, and a lot of the, a lot of the water supply solutions that are proposed are old school in the sense we're going to build a new reservoir, you know, say Dallas, Fort Worth, you know, they love building reservoirs up there, mm -hmm. but, but we've got direct potable reuse in mm -hmm. our state water plan. Um, I don't know of anybody else in the country that has that. So this is taking the wastewater from the wastewater treatment plant and completely cleaning it up and, and then reintroducing it into the potable drinking water system. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually two communities in central Texas that are um, planning to do it and actually doing the studies to be able to, to do it, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, and, and called DPR for short, direct potable reuse. Um, you know, that's, that's like the pinnacle of reuse. And mm -hmm. I never thought I would, I never thought I would see it in my career. And the fact that we're seeing that in central Texas, like Buda, city of Buda, mm -hmm. Dripping Springs have mm -hmm. DPR in their near-term water resource planning. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that blows me away. You know, El Paso's building a huge plant. Texas has the second, um, direct probable reuse plant in the world behind Nabibia. Um, Wichita Falls did it on an emergency basis. So we're, we're definitely a big leader there. The Austin is doing a lot of cool things. Austin got frightened after the 2008, 2015 drought, got concerned about climate change. So one, one issue with water planning in Texas is you don't have to, and therefore it isn't, uh, climate change is not built into the water planning. So Austin does its own water planning um, mm -hmm. that merges with the state process. Um, and, and along with that, you know, they've doing like that, that rainwater condensate mm -hmm. harvesting. I mentioned to you earlier, they're doing stuff like that. They're also doing, um, building scale black water reuse systems. So a new mm -hmm. permitting center up there, um, um, they have rainwater harvesting, condensate mm -hmm. harvesting, and they have it, the cutest damn little wastewater treatment plant you've ever seen. I've never cried at a grand opening for a wastewater treatment plant, but I cried at that one because it's it's just adorable. Um, and anybody can go see it. There's all kinds of placards that exp exp express what it is, but all the water that flushes down the toilets, down the sinks, down the water fountains, down the urinals, goes to this cute little wastewater treatment plant. And then out the other side, they bring that water back in the flush toilets and urinals again. And so hmm. they've been able to reduce their use of source water, which is Colorado River for Austin, by 95% um, wow. using those strategies. And that's, I think that's maybe the only, only the fifth place in the country that's done something like that. Um, it's not cheap, but uh, more and more, I mean, there's already um, folks in Austin that do want to do it. I, when I saw that project, I like, this is awesome. This is also unrealistic. Nobody else is going to do this. Sure. Uh, but but there's there are others that that uh, are planning to implement that as well. Yeah. Quick question: Have there ever been, uh, and maybe there are different ways of thinking about this, but you know, we talk about carbon taxing uh, because of climate change. 
Have there ever been the concept of carbon the water taxing for waste, you, you know, misuse or wrongful use, or is there any way of penalizing people for abusing water or something uh, to that effect? Yeah. So 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 broadly. It's state law. It's been state law maybe for 20 years now that that uh, public water suppliers have to have an inclining rate structure. So so basically that means the more you use, the more you pay. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know they try to keep the rates low. So if you're not using any outdoors, like like my wife and my water bill, thirty dollars a month in August. Um, oh wow! You know, and I tell that to my friends who are you know water outside. They're like, what the hell? You know, how is that possible? <laughs> um, but you water outside, you're paying for it. You know, your bills yeah. your bills probably ten times that um, yeah. in summer. The so that that's kind of baked into a, a lot of Texas, and then communities do have the ability. Um, you know, like Austin has codes that you know you have to follow the drought restrictions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you can be fined, but there's uh, the resources aren't applied to really effectively um, force people to do things right. like I was I was at a conference in Austin where um, kind of the guy that's in charge of that program was like, it takes five calls before they'll go out and look mm. <laughs> five complaints. Um, Let me ask a question here, mm -hmm. uh, which is. We haven't mentioned farming, and farming uses a lot of water, and we have learned to do it better as the Israelis led the way with drip feeding, no more overhead True. spraying. Uh, there are great efficiencies possible in farming, closed aqueducts instead of open ones with a lot of evaporation. Uh, <clears throat> when you have forest running water on the shallow situation where you lose a lot of it, uh, what is Texas doing to reduce the agricultural consumption of the farm? Yeah, great, great job uh, or great question. Um, there's, uh, you know, the oh, farmers in the Ogallala um, have done quite a bit. Um, you know, they're using um, more and more. They're using drip, which is the most efficient, but but they're also still using circles, but but uh, they call it LEPA. So they drop the sprinklers, you know, way down into the plants to minimize evaporation from the spray. Um, you know, so they're, they're up, up there, they're, they're probably in the 90, 95% efficiency level is what my ag friends tell me. Um, however, like down in lower Rio Grande Valley, they're still doing a lot of, you know, surface flood irrigation and things like that down there. So there's certainly opportunities to do things more efficiently down there. The, the state has supported applied research and application for farmers to use water more efficiently down there. Situation is a little different down there with the surface water, um, as well as the surface water law is different down there. So perhaps there's less incentive of investing because you know all the farmers get cut off before the uh, municipality um, and, and, and industry people get cut off. And so they're more likely to lose their water down there. But the state has provided funds, albeit limited, um, to implement um, cost efficient, you know, irrigation um, procedures. You know, my farmer friends um, always defend their ilk by, you know, it's like it's a business, water is a cost. And so there is a strong incentive. Um, but at the same time, just, just like uh, I think you mentioned Llewellyn, you know, it's, you're changing human behavior. And so it can be very difficult to change um, farmers' behavior to like maybe adopt the more um, might, might first appear radical approaches um, to, to save even more water going forward. Um, but you're right. So, so, so the rice farmers are not going away? Um, well, some of them are eventually going away. <laughs> 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 and and I say that because that's built into like the contract Austin has with the Lower Colorado River Authority. That's where all that water came from was a right. chunk of the rice farmers selling their water. Um, there's another set of rice farmers down there that those still have their senior rights. So for the time being, they're not they're not going away. But as the economic pressures become greater and the dollar, you know, the value of that water goes up, it's going to be more enticing for farmers to to sell out. Um, mm -hmm. you know, sell their water resources. Ogallala, we're draining that puppy. So it's, you know, the fate is... There has written. been a hope for some time that rice farming 
uh, can be subject to some sort of revolution the way most dreams were. Um, when we had the Green Revolution, uh, it hasn't happened yet. Rice swamp farming is still enormously abusive of water and other resources. Uh, and it's a very popular grain uh, mm -hmm. around the globe. And I think, uh, you know, when the rice farmers did that deal with LCRA, um, they weren't considering climate change. You know, they were looking at the past record to kind of mm -hmm. predict the reliability of their supply going forward, you know, as well as Austin growing into that supply going forward. Nobody considered climate change. And, you know, now they're, I, I would argue now they're paying the price for that. Mm hmm. So, Robert, tell us real quick what's going on at the Meadows Center. What's ahead of you in the next twelve months? Any new projects, research ideas, uh, new grants? What's going on? Yeah, there's a lot going on over here. So I'll just I'll just skim the surface. Um, Jenna Walker is um, kind of leading our charge on One Water. And one water is like using the built environment as a source of water. So rainwater harvesting, you know, could be gray water, condensate harvesting, stormwater harvesting, atmospheric water harvesting. Um, so she's leading efforts on that um, to kind of help people, communities in, in Texas um, um, implement some of those strategies. Um, I've got I've been working with students on some of the, looking at kind of the science, the engineering part of that. So I, I just had a graduated a student where we were evaluating um, um, what it would take to have reliable rainwater as a source for different parts of the state. And we found you know, we found out that even El Paso, you can collect drought drought proof in the sense that it'll get you through the drought of record. Mm -hmm. which is just as good as reservoirs and how we plan for reservoirs these days, even in El Paso. Um, you'd be living alone um, because there'd only be enough water for one person. You'd still get the shower every day and you wouldn't have to do like Llewellyn does and and uh, leave the to let, let yellow mellow. Um, hoping to continue that work as well as doing some work and condensate harvesting. Um, I've got a, another student who's focused on water planning and climate change. Mm -hmm. And so um, he's got a, he's got a study coming out soon looking at perceptions of climate change by water resource managers in the state. And then um, he's also kind of tracking like what has happened, what's been in discussion and policy discussion in Texas on climate change, how has the terminology changed over time. And then ultimately he'll be looking at, you know, how Texas could build climate change into water planning, whether that's at the state level, regional level, water supply level um, or and even an individual level um, um, to give folks that want to build additional resilience in there. So, um, so that's just some of the, a few of the things that um, um, that we're working on. You know, a lot of it's innovative water technology, trying to get trying to convince people that it's, you know, it's reliable, doable and yeah. uh, and then get Texas ready. Is there a federal role here? We normally we look at some sort of national plan, uh, but not with water because you have such discrepancies in water shortage and water abundance. Um, but should we have some kind of national plan or at least some national supervision of water resources? Rivers run through many states. Yeah. So so there. You know the. U.S. government has pretty much left it up to the states to decide how to do this. You know, there are um, surface water compacts um, where agreements between the states are then carried to Congress. Colorado um, River Basin. All that, yeah. There, there isn't anything on the groundwater side. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court suggested they would probably follow a similar path as surface water when surface water conflicts have come to them, there was a case between Mississippi and Tennessee and groundwater um, that popped up there. Um, yeah, you know, I've, I've, I'm have i not a native Texan, but I've lived here long enough that my knee-jerk reaction is, oh, hell no, we don't want to. <laughs> That's, <going in> here. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, but, you know, we'd be more than happy to receive funds. And so Texas has certainly been happy to receive mm -hmm. funds for water infrastructure at the federal level. Um, Texas, of course, is been providing its own funds, um, but the Texas way is loans, really. Um, the federal 
federal monies that come in, those tend to help disadvantaged communities that don't have the resources. And then Texas is like, hey, we'll we'll um, subsidize interest rates essentially in a sophisticated way. Um, but you're still going to have to pay for your infrastructure. And then ultimately in Texas, you know, we leave it up to the individual communities. It's like you, we've, you know, we, we as a state essentially force people to plan. Um, but then ultimately it's up to those communities to implement the strategies, you know, raise the rates if they need to. Um, looking, Llewellyn kind of looking into, um, um, and I guess, you know, being part geologist and part catastrophist. And so I think, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, it could be total hell breaks loose on climate change. And we have a, we go into a medieval mega drought style drought. Um, I, you know, when I, when I run those scenarios through my head, I'm like, yeah, there's going to be a federal nexus at that point because, you know, be a multi-state solution. I mean, Arizona has been talking to folks over here in Texas about building seawater desal plants and piping that water to Arizona. They've also been talking to folks in Texas about running a pipeline from the Mississippi River across Texas over mm-hmm. to Arizona. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see, are there federal dollars that come in with that, that make that water much more enticing for Texas communities as well as those in Arizona. So you don't see, so you don't see, um, you don't, you really don't see a way for, I mean, you know, when I think about it real quick, there are roughly 52,000 water utilities and, you know, water systems are not interconnected. They're very local. Uh, and people are, you know, very near and dear to that. Um, you don't see the concept of a co-op of people gathering and banding together and saying, let's solve this challenging problems of rain too much over here, not enough over there, build a new system solution tax thing or something. Um, no, I do. I do see that as an avenue. And one mm-hmm. example is here in San Marcos, you know, San Marcos mm-hmm. has teamed up with Kyle. I think Buta might be in that deal. Guadalupe Blanco river authority to import groundwater from the Criso Wilcox to meet the growing water needs. Mm-hmm. And, and by joining forces, you know, in building one pipeline instead of four or five, right. there's, there's cost savings for everybody in there. Um, mm-hmm. So, so yeah, I, I do, I do see that. Um, and there's other examples of that happening mm-hmm. across the state too. So there, there needs to, um, you know, need is the mother of invention. So there like has to be a strong need to bring people to the table. Otherwise, sure. for the most part, they're going to try to go it alone as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And then some of our rural communities, they're too far apart. Um, right. And so that makes it, that makes it difficult, but droughts have a way of clarifying people's mm-hmm. thoughts on that. And so right. you definitely see. Um, even rural communities across large distances interconnecting to build, you know, resilience mm-hmm. across across their different systems. So, so my last question to you would be the following, which impacts all of us, and I'm always curious. I think we have talked about it in the past. The pricing of water. How come the water in LA is ten times the price of the water in San Marcos, but it's the same water? Um, we're just better about managing money in Texas than they are. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just crazy. Why is water so expensive? In certain um, places? Well, you know, p- part of the San Marcos story is the Edwards Aquifer, which is this incredible water resource. Right. Um, dirt cheap. You know, it's artesian flow at the surface, so you don't even have much pumping costs right um so traditionally you know that water has been dirt cheap but this this project i just described bringing water from the mm-hmm. east and a pipeline with well fields you know that's going to raise rates you look at la i mean they're reaching out a long ways to get sure. water resources in um but i do do often hear people's like you know when do people pay for the real cost of water um you know and in texas my understanding is state law is such that you know, that what gets charged for your water is to recover the costs for producing that water. And it's kind of avoid cities from using water bills as income generators for other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you in Texas, at least you're paying what that water costs, but there's externalities to that water mm-hmm. production, you know, environmental impacts, um, 
you know, maybe even equity impacts if your water's coming from a rural area and you're drying up people's wells, that, that may or may not generally is not um, right. built into the, your, your bill. So, um, but I, I'll guarantee you one thing, our bills are going to get higher right. with all this growth. The easy water has gone. We're going to have to be importing more water. Um, it's just going to get more expensive. Yeah. I, so something else that is interesting to me, or at least, you know, when I was at Austin Energy running the power company, uh, I was in many discussions related to water. They were our number one customer using energy to manage their, you know, their pumps and everything else. And one of the things that always came up, but it never made it, was the notion of why wouldn't the city of Austin bottle water and sell it, you know, at the stores? And the, the the city never wanted to do that, not not to cross the line and be in a competitive market, government versus private sector. But my God, when when was the last time anybody went to buy a bottle of water? A bottle of water almost cost two bucks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excuse me, gentlemen, I have to leave. I've got a, a somebody waiting on the phone for me. Okay. Uh, well, so good to visit, yeah. Llewellyn. Nice to see you, Robert. Yes. An interesting subject um, and one that's going to dominate the headlines for quite a while, I think. Or so every day, as it were. Absolutely. And we'll 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 gather again at the Utah 360 in a few weeks in Austin. We'll see you in a few weeks. Bye bye. I've got to go. Bye, Sorry. Llewellyn. So what do you think, Robert? Is our cities ever going to get into the bottle water business? Um, probably not because the private sector does for the most <laughs> part have that covered. But like, like I, I love to read water bottles. So if I right. wind up getting a bottle of water at a conference, I always look to see where's this water coming from. Right. And it always cracks me up when like there's one, it's like the Houston public water supply system. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so sometimes they're right up front. They tell you that. Right, um, right, right. So, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they will or won't. Um, and maybe, maybe one last thing is, uh, that's kind of an emerging issue, which ties back to innovation and artificial mm -hmm. intelligence is, uh, mm -hmm. data centers, you know, Bitcoin mining and, um, and then AI kind mm -hmm. of centers are also water hogs. Oh yeah. I'm um, using water for water cooling. And so, um, I was talking to a water marketer in central mm -hmm. Texas and he was, he was like, um, when it's a bidding war between a community and an AI company or data company, you know, guess who's mm -hmm. going to win? <laughs> it's not going to be the community. So there's going to be more and more competition coming up too. To end on a positive note, I do feel, you know, Texas has the tools. It, it has mm -hmm. the water, has the resources, you know, has the talent um, to solve its water problems. It has the Gulf of Mexico. So I do feel, um, um, in general, I'm pretty pretty positive about things going forward. Right. Yeah, it's uh, the, you know, the digitalization of the of the planet. You know, data centers, chips, factories, all that. Lots of water consumption. The this the I understand that the Samsung Fab up north in Taylor is going to consume a gigantic amount of water. But they're doing some. Uh, I was able to tour their factory in austin uh -huh. and kind of talk to their sustainability folks and they're doing some amazing things they're, they're trying to, to read net net zero on water among other wow. things and wow they do rainwater harvesting and condensate harvesting a lot of on-site reuse so um it's, but it's still you know there's still a lot of water that's needed for that but sure. that's what we need for jobs and our economy and you know for for living in this state so we just gotta gotta figure it out be innovative, come up with new ways. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Solve, solve those problems. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Robert, thank you again. Sorry that my cohorts had to sneak out. I hope that, uh, <laughs> uh that John Butler got you something from the governor on water. Um, we'll circle back. At All the right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. All the best. You too. Bye-bye. Bye now.